Welcome to the Timescales Interviews. I'm Grego, your host. This interview is being recorded in the United States and the United Kingdom. Today we have a very special guest, the extraordinary Nigel Fares. Hello, Mr. Fares. How are you today? Oh, please call me Nigel. Hello. How are you? Okay, thank you. And, and please call me Greg. Doing well, thank you. Um, <laughs> Am I correct that you are currently located in England? Yes, I'm. I'm actually right on the very west tip. Um, I'm in Cornwall, um, which is uh, an ancient land full of mining history and uh, and old mysterious stone circles and things like that. So I'm right on the end of England. So yeah it's where i've always wanted to be and I've, i'm just coming up to my year anniversary of living here so i'm in heaven wonderful that sounds really nice cornwall mm. okay um uh, nigel fairs wears many professional hats he is an actor a voice performer an author a director a sound designer a musician <laughs> And he's been involved with Big Finish for many years with quite a long list of credits. Uh, Nigel is an absolutely perfect example of success in <laughs> the worlds of Doctor Who and beyond. And I'm extremely grateful that he's made himself available for this interview today. Thank you very much, Nigel. Oh, uh, my absolute pleasure. And, and thank you for calling me a success i think as uh, every artist i know um certainly professional artists doesn't doesn't view themselves as a success no matter what they've done and i'm i'm absolutely the same so it's so kind of you to describe me that way thank you yes sir I really and i it. i think that it's actually very undeniable and i think that people are just about ready to learn that in this interview um, Nig <laughs> Nigel has a brand new Big Finish Doctor Who story coming out in just days. As part of the Doctor Who Unbound Doctor of War Destiny, his story is titled Who Am I? Which is a great name, by the way. I, I like that. And I've pre-ordered it, and I can't wait to hear it. Uh, that is available right now for pre-order at bigfinish.com. And there's going to be a direct link down below in the YouTube video where you can just click on that and go directly to the order page. And for people listening on an audio stream format, that's at bigfinish.com, B-I-G-F-I-N-I-S-H.com. Nigel, how excited are you to have a brand new Big Finish Doctor Who story coming out in just days titled Who Am I? Yeah, um, well, I, actually, before I say how unexcited or excited I am, uh, can I explain the title? Because yes, uh, who I, I would love that. It, it, it comes from episode three of one of my favorite Doctor Who television stories in 1977, I think, Face of Evil. Um, and and okay. the episode ends with a mad computer um, who's got the, the doctor's brain attached uh, to it, um, shouting, screaming, "Who am I? Who am I? Who okay. am I?" And I just that that I remember that moment very clearly as one of my favourite moments, which is why I think um, it was initially a pleasure to take this sort of retelling of Face of Evil on. Uh, unfortunately, my experience of writing it wasn't altogether a happy one. And at one point I asked my name to be taken off it. Um, I hate to start on a downer, uh, but I asked them to call me Roberta Blind, which I thought was really quite a clever take on the, is it Robin Bland that Terence Dix asked himself to be called <laughs> when he didn't like one of his scripts? Uh, but they, they they wouldn't go with that. And And... <laughs> Unfortunately, my name's still on it. But um, <laughs> having said, it was not uh, 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 not too good an experience writing this one. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I will be excited to hear what um, Jeffrey Beavers does with the master within it, because uh, um, I think he's a fantastic actor, and the whole thing is leading, as I remember, to a big 
full on speech by the master. And I can't wait to hear what Jeffrey Beavers does with that. Uh, that that so that I'm interested in that if I'm not as excited as I might be to hear it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Uh, um, so can you tell us a bit about you, such as who are you? Uh, where are you from? You know, things that drive and motivate you, things you love, just a little bit about you. Yeah, um, well, uh, uh, I, I, as you said in your introduction, I'm, I'm, I'm an actor, but um, uh, to supplement that and also, also sometimes to create that uh, work, I do other work like writing and uh, sometimes directing, producing, that kind of thing. Um, but primarily, uh, I'm an actor. And what motivates me really is um, a desire to work with other like-minded, creative people, uh, which is what uh, it brings me joy. And um, yeah, wh wh when you're working with other creative people to explore what it is to be human, and uh, to look around the world uh, with them and talk about it and create art that reflects the world. That's what motivates me. I suspect like many other actors in particular, there's also a desire to be validated, a desire for validation um, behind there somewhere um, that probably motivates me as well. Okay. It's, it's very interesting. Um, Recently, a friend of mine um, that I work with or met through Big Finish, David Warner, he died um, this year. And so I've spent a, a, quite a lot of the last month talking either in interviews or with friends uh, about him. And he, like many actors and myself, uh, ha ha have a dark side, a, a sort of a doubting um depressive side uh and he and i uh, kind of bonded on that and talked about that a lot and how that when you're working that 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 black dog as churchill called it tends to sort of creep into the background and go and lick its paws or whatever and you can enjoy life again feel validated and feel worthwhile but when you're out of work it's the the, the black dog tends to um hover i'm afraid <laughs> okay <laughs> which okay. um but uh i i believe that a, a lot of creative people and actors have that and and it adds a real essence to their work it real adds an understanding and truth to their work so long answer to a short question sorry but that's what motivates no, no. me it's that it's it's that validation and then that um, need to explore and shine a light on humanity. Okay, very good. So how long did you know David Warner? Uh, well, I met him, uh, I cast him in, um, or we cast him, sorry, in, in uh, uh, Sapphire, um, yeah, Sapphire and Steel, which was um, a cult TV program in the 70s, I think, over here. Um, um, Big Finish did an audio range based on it. Um, mm -hmm. the, we couldn't get the original stars, so... Um, we had David and Susanna Harker. Um, so that must have been around about 2005, something like that. So, yes, I've known him a few years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, all right. So does January of 1976, uh, <laughs> BBC One oh. and a TV program called hey look that's me does that uh, happen to ring any bells <laughs> <laughs> horrible question <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> it, it brings my black dog that i've already talked about and the whole lot of nightmares with it yes it yes that, <laughs> a really a dark period of my childhood where i went on this local tv program and said i was a doctor who fan and then for a whole year afterwards got bullied um, by students by teachers by everyone really um mm. and and then moved schools and never mentioned doctor who again and they they asked because i was on this tv program and it had some sort of anniversary uh, maybe five years maybe 10 years later i don't know they asked me back and i said no 
I'm, I'm not interested. Thank you very much. But yeah, okay. no, horrible. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's move on then. Yes. Thank um, you. Yeah. Um, today we're going to primarily focus on your professional works. Um, no. But there's a few older fan productions that I want to very briefly touch on. Um, many big Finnish uh, fans have likely heard of the audio visuals, which, uh, as you know, was a fan produced audio adventure series from the 1980s through the 1990s. Um, they were produced on cassette tapes, and I recall collecting some of them uh, and listening to them way back then, even while I'm in the States. Um, they were never for sale. You would purchase a blank cassette tape, and in my case, you would pay for the postage to ship from England to the to the States, um, and then the stories were free. They were copied onto the tapes by other fans. Um, and what do you recall about working on these? I, I know that you you did some music, and didn't you write one of them? Yeah, I, I think I wrote a couple. Um, that, that was, yeah, I think so. Yeah and yeah. did post-production on a few um okay. uh, it, it, in in many ways that that was the good that came out of that um television program because if it hadn't have been for that um a few years before i wouldn't have been asked as a professional actor to come on to the um audio visuals because nick briggs recognized me from the telly when i was a little boy um really? so that's how i got involved um, wow. we, uh, the, we we were all um, professional actors, but it wasn't a paid gig. So mm -hmm. it did mean that I got to work. I got to know Nick Briggs and, and Gary Russell and John Ainsworth and, you know, all the big, fin Jason Hay Gallery, uh, all, all the uh, audio, uh, no, uh, Big Finish people before Big Finish was a thing. Um, right. Right. And also I got to work with some other really wonderful actors like Michael Wisher. The original Davros, um, oh, he wow. was uh, in one of mine, and also I, I think he was in the first one. I think we were we were both playing the villains in the first one I did. So to work with people of that caliber was just wonderful, and wow. he was brilliant and eccentric and 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 just lovely. My first Davros, and I'm about to go on tour with my second Davros, Terry Malloy. So uh, that um, I, I have got a few to catch up on, I think. <laughs> okay, now you say going on tour. Are you talking about going on some, going to some conventions? No, 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 no. We're doing a theater tour. Um, oh, theater. Yeah, yeah. Sherlock okay. Holmes, um, Hound of the Baskervilles. So, okay. Uh, Colin Baker's playing Holmes. Um, Terry's playing uh, Watson. And I'm playing Lord Baskerville. So oh, wow. that's going to be fun. Okay. Now, that is um, something that I completely missed when I was working on the questions for you. So ah. uh, would you like to elaborate on that, Annie? Uh, yeah, well, um, it, it's going to be an interesting tour because a new thing to come out here, I don't know whether it's been doing the rounds in the States, are theatre tours that are set up as those old-fashioned radio plays. So mm -hmm. you come into the theatre and it's, it's a radio studio, basically, with microphones and, uh, you know, scripts and actors dressed up nicely. And, and they read a radio play. So this is what it's going to be. It's going to be a radio play on stage of Hound of the Baskervilles. So it's going to be quite an interesting little tour that's going all over the country. I'm um, just UK for the moment. So, OK. And, yeah, and with it. Wow. And with yourself, uh, Terry Malloy, Colin Baker and others. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How, yeah. how how many stops are on that tour? Um, we, we do it for a month, and I think it's um mostly one nighters. So I would say around about thirty. I think. Oh yeah. wow! Wow, mm. that's going to keep you busy. It uh, is. It is. Yes. I guess it's a good um, thing I asked you if I could interview you when I did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Otherwise, okay. I might be doing it from some grotty little hotel somewhere in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I did an interview recently with Gareth Preston, and your name came up, and that's uh, what put the idea in my mind to, to contact you about an interview. Um, Gareth had mentioned working with you, Sylvester McCoy, and several other people on a comedy spoof titled, Do You Have a License to Save This Planet? And uh, which was a fan produced spinoff uh, produced by BBV Productions. And uh, Gareth had a really funny story about how 
your whole group walked into a restaurant late at one night and uh they were about to close so they weren't terribly happy to see you guys arrive <laughs> and i guess they didn't realize that one of you was sylvester mccoy <laughs> Um, and Gareth had uh, told me about that night, and I, I thought it was very interesting and funny. And um, so what I've learned is that you did some sound design and music and a bit of acting on things like Zygons and Cyberon. Do you yes. recall those days? Y yes, I do. Well, I, 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 um, I remember filming, um, do you have a license to save this planet with Sylvester, wasn't it? Um Mm -hmm. uh yes um i i didn't really know what what it was all about and was, i think i only saw my scenes but um the, uh, bill bags the director said um could you make your character like um something out of league of gentlemen which a mutual friend of ours was making at, at, at the time when it's all very eccentric sort of um um yeah eccentric odd characters so I, I played this um neighbor who was a little bit very strange and then I played um a version of Anthony Ainley which was great fun um mm -hmm. I I had the idea of coming in and I brought I think four or five costumes for the master I don't think it was called the master but it was the again the direction was play him like Anthony Ainley and I, I think I had a really ill-fitting wig that I wore backwards mm. um, or inside out and had these costumes that got camp master costumes that got camper and camper and camper um, and so during the scene the, the face off the final face off with Sylph uh, my character just morphed from a, a slightly theatrical costume into full-on Eric Roberts campery with a cloak and everything so that was uh, that was quite fun um I didn't really understand the script if I'm honest when I when I um read more than my bits but uh I think yes I worked with Bill for quite time on the audios and I think that's where I did my first um um paid sound um, design and music uh, was for him. Um, I'd always done it, um, you know, as a hobby uh, and at school and bullied people into doing sound plays and things. But that was the first time I'd got paid for it, but doing it for Bill. So, yeah. Okay. And then eventually doing it for Big Finish as well. Right. OK. Mm. All right. So um, thank you for letting me touch on the, the old fan productions. And uh, mm. now we're going to move on to your professional career. Um, I've learned that you trained at Breton Hall College um, mm -hmm. with quite a list of, of uh, works and stage production. Um, could you tell us in 30 minutes or less <laughs> about, <laughs> your, about your stage production works? And I guess we should at least try to mention Dr. Watson in To Kill a Canary, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, The Mousetrap, um, and of course, conversations with an acid bath murderer <laughs> oh yeah uh, well i did the, the mouse talk i did the mouse trap in the west end which is the world's longest running play um i, I did it with for a year with um nick courtney who w was the brigadier um uh on dr who obviously um so that was that was a thrill to work with him for a year he's he was a sweetie um in fact, we we were doing a matinee and an evening show on the day that he got married to Karen, yeah. his yeah, his wife, wow. and uh, he had the wedding between the no, he had the wedding bef in the morning, did a matinee, went back for the wedding reception, then did the evening show, uh, really? and <laughs> yes, and uh, I noticed that uh, bless him. He'd had um, uh, maybe a couple of glasses at the at the, <laughs> at the reception, <laughs> and uh, at not yes at the wedding reception, and um, yeah. So there was a slight slay swaying in the evening, but I remember <laughs> also on that on that evening in the interval, him just turning around and saying, "Oh, Nigel, this is the happiest I have ever been." 
uh, on, wow. on his wedding day. So that, and he was just a darling man, a, a, just a, a real gent and just, a really good actor as well and self-effacing and just lovely um i've been very lucky to work with some really really lovely actors um in and out of the doctor who universe um what were the other the other ones oh one flew over the uh, cuckoo's nest. yeah one flew over the yeah. cuckoo's nest i did that uh a few a couple of years back i think um it's difficult to tell with covid um maybe three years now maybe four um in frankfurt uh, and the director changed the sexes of the two leads. So I was Nurse Ratchet, played as a man, um, who's that very scary nurse. I don't know whether you know the, the movie with uh, Jack Nicholson. Um, and uh, the Jack Nicholson part was played by uh, um, a very feisty young actress. So that, that changed the dynamic really quite um it made it really quite interesting and, and nurse ratchet is sort of seen as a villain um but i i love playing villains I, I, they're far more interesting than the goodies um because the thing with playing a villain is that no villain thinks they're a villain they're mm -hmm. no no evil person thinks they're evil they always think they're right putin thinks he's right i mean the, the <laughs> hitler thought he was right you know that and and so to as a as an trump actor, thinks he's right trump thinks he's right yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah all the all our major villains right. <laughs> um god knows what liz trust thinks anyway um that's another <laughs> thought <laughs> um uh so i've distracted <laughs> myself with thoughts of bliss yeah no the, no the thing is to play these evil characters you have to get into their mind and and find uh, a motivation for, for what they do um so whether you're playing nurse ratchet whether you're playing uh, the acid bath murderer john george Hake, mm -hmm. who absolutely believed he was in the right uh <laughs> by killing these people right. um <laughs> But when you research them, either as an actor or as a writer, I wrote that one as well as playing Haig. Um, you you look for what created that person who did that, um, did those things. And in yep. Haig's case, he was brought up by a religious sect called the Plymouth Brethren that really messed him up as a child and, and sent his morals all over the place. So he'd had that really troubled childhood where he was locked in behind a wall and and his view of the world was really skew Um, But of course, to play him, you have to get into that frame of mind. Wow. And so you justify absolutely everything that you, that you do. It's interesting. Wow. I'd quite like to talk to Terry about what he thought about Davros and how, because I, I, I've heard, I've not worked with him yet. I'm looking forward to that. Mm. Um, but I've heard that he is as keen as I am on discovering the truth of characters and, and being quite meticulous about that. So I'm looking forward okay. to discussing how now, Davros got to be Davros. Okay, what is the name of that stage tour? Uh, which one? With uh, the, Colin with, Terry? Yes. Yeah, it's The Hound of the Baskervilles. Okay. Possibly one of uh, the, the most famous Holmes stories, I think. Mm. okay yeah. very good um what about dr watson in uh oh. to kill a canary yes well there we are i've uh yeah terry is playing dr watson in how right. the vacuables and i've already played him so yeah uh -huh. that's going to be a watson off i think <laughs> there you um, go <laughs> i i loved playing watson it, it was i think it was a, either the same year or very close i played inspector morse who uh, I don't know whether you've heard of Inspector Morse, but he's um, oh, yes, <laughs> uh, yeah, over here he's sort of quite a, a, a famous famous um, detective. So I played him in one, and then I played Doctor Watson in another. So I was I thought, oh, I'm going to be playing all the um, all the um, inspectors now. And oh, <laughs> interestingly enough, I've just thought of this. Colin also played Inspector Morse in the 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 same tour 
no, no, a different tour of the same play. Um, so I can have a Morse off with Colin and a Watson off with Terry. <laughs> I, I think it's going to be great fun. There are going to be <laughs> shotguns at dawn. <laughs> Sounds like it was meant to be. <laughs> I think, yes, well, thank you for um, making me think about that. I'm looking yeah, forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so <clears throat> I see that you uh, co-wrote a story with Louise Jameson. And yeah. um, for, I believe almost everyone who watches or listens to this is going to know who Louise Jameson is. Uh, she is an actor that played Leela in the Doctor Who TV series. I believe she started in the Tom Baker era. And she, did, uh, yes. she also was in a, the first part of the Peter Davison era, I believe. No. no, no so she, no. Was only... she was. She was all oh. Tom, yeah. Okay. Um, that was a different companion that, that went from Tom Baker to, uh, to the Peter Davison era. Um, okay. So you, uh, your work with her is titled my gay best friend, which was a stage play in New York city and London. Um, can mm. you tell us about that and what it was like working with Louise as a co-writer? Yeah, well, Louise is my best friend, so um, okay, we, we we've worked uh, together quite a lot. Um, I kind of bullied her into being my best friend by casting <laughs> in in a big finish because I'd always admired her work. I always thought she was a fantastic stage actor and uh, mm -hmm. actress, and and also television, obviously, uh, she's brilliant. Um, so I'd followed her on stage mainly. Um, and then when I got the opportunity to cast a character in The Tomorrow People, which was a series for Big Finish that I produced, we kind of clicked right from day one. And uh, so I, I we we worked together more and more and more. And then um, now we're best friends, really. And we got the idea for my gay best friend on holiday, I think. Um, I think think we'd been to the south of France or something and and it was either in the pool or, or, or on the journey back we had this idea about doing a series of monologues um about um uh, a, a, a frustrated northern lass um and who's frightened of singing and her gay best friend, who's about to um, <laughs> donate, uh, become a father to a couple of lesbians. Um, and um, we turned this into a, a two-person show, uh, which was partly autobiographical. We, the friendship was sort of based on, on our friendship, um, okay. but also um delved into our own pasts a little bit and fictionalized them and and actually it we we toured quite a lot of places uh, but new york was one place we went and london was another place we went and uh yeah for, we did that on and off for quite a few years um and because we're besties you know we just had a lovely time doing it um although initially when i first worked with her i thought oh my god i'm, I'm working with louise james and this is just amazing yeah, especially when imagine. we did yeah especially when we did Shakespeare together now she is well a goddess when it comes to Shakespeare she she lives and breathes Shakespeare she's an expert so to work with her on some Shakespeare was astonishing yeah wow. um, you know I, yeah, no. I I remember reading about that tour when it was happening and uh mm. the one thing that I took note of was the uh, stop in New York City um, being an American. Um, do you spend a lot of time in New York City by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> no, I um, no, I've only been a few times, uh, but it was so nice to go there and work. Uh, right. Absolutely lovely. Yeah. It's a it's a big, crazy place, isn't it? It is. Yeah. I loved Central <laughs> Park. I'm not really a city person. Um, I think even London's too big for me. So New York was a little bit of a problem, but um, it's got that lovely Central Park right in the middle. So I enjoyed all that right. bit. Yeah, <laughs> Central Park is definitely a gem of the city. Uh, and uh, here in San Francisco, we have another Central Park. A lot of people don't realize it. It's called Golden Gate Park. 
and it has the same I design. know. Yeah. I love yes. it. I yeah. love San Francisco. Yeah. I don't know. But somehow I didn't click that you're in San Francisco. Oh my God. A home of Armistead Morpin and, and, and everything and um the sea lions and uh oh yeah it's that chocolate factory um I remember very well. Yes. And yeah, yes. I, I love now, San Francisco. As far as sea lions, you're gonna see a lot more in Monterey. You know, there there's a lot of sea lions that hang out over here on Pier 39. But yes, in, that's it. in yeah, Pier 39. Now uh on Monterey Bay, uh there's recently there's been a tremendous amount of sea lions and they get very close to you. Uh in fact, you could probably reach out and touch one, which I don't think you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of scary when you have this these massive uh beasts that are are here and hundreds of pounds each, and there's hundreds of them. It's a whole <laughs> beach covered with them. Um, but anyway, um, we How have did we that, get off uh, on sea have, lions. We, we, no, no, no. We uh, can I just in here in Cornwall, we don't have sea lions, but we have seals, and they're okay. sort of little mini sea lions, and we mm -hmm. also have hundreds of them, which was an attraction here down in Cornwall. Anyway, let's get off sea lions and seals and okay. talk about yep. whatever's next. I, I, ha I do have a next question. In fact, it involves Louise Jameson as well, so this should uh, flow well. Um, I see you uh, also worked with Louise Jameson and Max Day as actors in My Mother Was an Alien, Is That Why I'm Gay? Could you yeah. elaborate on that story, uh, which is part of the Big Finish drama showcase? Yes, that was based on a stage play I wrote in something like 1997, which in itself was inspired by a wonderful actress called Jacqueline Pierce who played Servalan in um, Blake Seven, which was a kind of rival to Doctor Who for a while here in, uh, in the UK. She was very camp and glamorous and um, with a filthy laugh. I just adored her. I got to know her through Jay John Ainsworth, who was, um, uh, who was working for Big Finish even then, I think. Um, or maybe not then. Anyway, he, I, 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 he was a friend of mine, and through him, I got to know Jacqueline. Um, and I, I just thought, I have to write a play about this woman. She's fantastic. Uh, so I wrote that, uh, and it went on stage a couple of times back in the 90s. Then I revived it in uh, something like 2009. Yeah, about 10 years later, I guess. Um, uh, for a couple of festivals in the U in in the south of England, and then we decided to turn it into um, an audio version uh, with Louise playing the Jacqueline Pierce character, who is basically no. a faded sci-fi diva who is invited back after years and years and years to to for a revamp of this old sci-fi series uh, that she used to star in. Um, but finds that everyone's grown grown older. No one can quite do it anymore. She feels incredibly old and crushed by the whole thing um, and has a really odd relationship with her son, played in the audio by the wonderful Max Day. Um, and I think I played his boyfriend. Can't quite remember it. Um, yeah, I think I think that was it. I think the dynamic was between the three of us. Um, but Louise, of course, as uh, she was fantastic, as in okay. any part she played. Um, the thrill, actually, of that, although Jacqueline never played it on stage or audio or anything, was she at one point was going to, and we had a read through with Jacqueline reading all these lines that were inspired by her in the first place. And that was an utter thrill um, to hear that once. But equally thrilling to have Louise playing as well. Okay. All right. Um, I see that you even have television credits to your name. Uh, East Enders, uh, which I think some people might have heard of. <laughs> uh, Emmerdale, um, Silent Witness, The Unforgotten. Um, did you write stories for these series? No, no, no. Uh, they're, they're, they're just um, uh, jobbing actor roles, you know, very nice oh, okay. too. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, okay. I love to play the odd 
judge or whatever in in one of those um yeah so okay, okay. Just um okay very good um i i did look for writing credits for those stories but there's a massive amount of them so yes. i i didn't find anything um as far as a writing credit so uh okay um let's shift gears here and let's focus on some of your big finish works um and i guess a good place to start off would be acting since you were primarily an actor um i see that you've acted in audio adventures uh with uh doctor who of course um and then dark shadows and bernice summerfield um would you be able to share any of your highlights with your acting experience at big finish um really the the highlights are getting to work with an amazing group of people mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i'm seeing a pattern here yeah, yes, you are, aren't you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and Big Finish is tremendous for that. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm so lucky as a, you know, my, if my 12-year-old self, who was, you know, a bit geeky, a bullied, as I say, and a bit of a Doctor Who fan, if he could see the number of Doctor Who people that I've worked with over my career, he I think he'd be flabbergasted. But also <laughs> I've worked with some other wonderful, wonderful actors thanks to Big Finish. Um, I've just finished post-production on the second series of Shilling and Sixpence Investigate, uh, um, which is my own uh, murder mystery series, starring mm -hmm. David Warner, sadly gone now, and, and Celia Imrie, who's a fantastic actress. Um, she's... Um, uh, I'm saying to all your watchers and listeners, if you don't know who she is, Google her, because... Uh, she's just she's just incredible and she was one of those actresses that we all my generation all grew up with and could quote um virtually every line she said for Victoria Wood for example who's a comic genius also no longer with us but did they just have a couple of days in studio with her and with David people in the likes I've worked with Timothy West. I've worked, I mean, just loads and loads of really amazing people. And when you work with them, you up your own game. So um, okay. you, that would make sense. I, I think you give a better performance because you're in the in the studio with these astoundingly good people. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, how do you could you remind us of her name again? Celia Emery. Celia Emery. Okay. Yes. Um, we're going we're going to put a Google link down at the bottom of this on YouTube where people uh don't have to Google her. They can just click on that. So oh, okay. that's great. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um <laughs> now as a writer, I see that you contributed to the early uh 2000s series of Big Finish Doctor Who anthology books. Um, and one of those is titled Snapshots. Now, those books are, they seem to be extremely rare these days because when you can find one, they're very expensive. And um, when I was working on the questions for you last night, I checked my bookshelf and I'm missing that one. Uh, so could you tell us about Snapshots and your work on that? Um, I did see that you wrote a story in it which is titled She Knew, which is a third doctor story. Yes. That, that, <laughs> yes. She Knew was a short story that took place after the Green Death, which is Joe Grant's final story. Uh, John Pertwee gets in, the third doctor, gets in Bessie, his car, and drives off away from her wedding reception. Um, and in my story, he stops in a pub um, for a glass of whiskey or something and has a conversation with someone who's also just left his partner. And they just have a discussion, as I remember, about loss and about love. And then they both go on their different ways. So it was a gentle little story, um, as I remember. I think I'd probably just broken up with a partner and and, <laughs> and then was asked to write a story. And I thought, oh, I'm writing about that. I'm writing about my favourite Doctor Who um, and this chap who's just 
split up and i'm going to have some closure on this and then okay. uh, and then yeah so that was okay. uh, that was what she knew was about yeah okay good now you have me curious i want to read that so i'm i'm going to have to start uh, doing a search for a rare book here pretty pretty soon i i, I want to read that story i think i've got a copy somewhere but where it is i've no idea if it's rare and expensive i might sell it <laughs> you maybe you should. It's it's a shame you don't have a whole box of those in your basement or something. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yeah. I knew I should have asked for more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It seems like there's a uh, good number of big finish works where you did both the music and sound design. Mm. Um to and to drop a few names, uh Mistfall, Last of the Cybermen, uh the Peterloo Massacre, Maker of Demons. Cuddlesome, which was originally uh, from audiovisuals, and even a fourth Doctor adventure that you also co-wrote with Louise Jameson, uh, mm -hmm. and that was titled The Abandoned. So We wrote most of that in a jacuzzi. <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> yeah, we, we went to a health spa to write this Doctor Who script, and... We just met in the jacuzzi every day and 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 thrashed it out, um, <laughs> thrashed the storyline out. Yeah, that was a joy. <laughs> well, hilarious! <laughs> I wouldn't expected to to hear be hearing that. <laughs> no. So, um. So, could you tell it? it you know, I'm going to have to go listen to the abandoned now. Um, <laughs> I don't <laughs> think you see the influence. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> could you tell us what it's like to produce uh, music and sound design, such as uh, what in instruments do you use? Um, is it primarily uh, keyboard or synth? Yeah, yes, it, it's all synth synthesizer. All synth really. Okay. Although for one of those, um, I think it was uh, a Sylvester and Bonnie was in it, whichever one that was. Um, uh, I got a friend of mine who had a didgeridoo to... Do you know what a didgeridoo is? No, I don't. Oh, what is that? It's, it's an old... It's an Australian um, sort of um, wooden instrument that you blow into and it makes a really sort of wow, wow, wow sort of noise. And I got him, and, and it's quite rhythmic as well, all controlled with the mouth, this massive wooden tube. Um, and I got him to do some um, recording of rhythms on this thing, and I used that as the basis of the uh, of, of the music for that one. Okay. Um, but basically, yes, it was all um, synthesized. I um, I, I wouldn't really call myself a composer, but I do hear I do hear tunes in my head, and I can't read or write music, unfortunately, but. Um, I, I can put down an instrument track by track and build up a sort of sound. But but really, the approach to the music side of it has always been um, inspired um, by greatness okay. again, by John Williams, who, who always had, um, certainly in his earlier work, I'm less familiar with his work now, but in, say, The Empire Strikes Back or something like that, he'd have a mm -hmm. character theme, uh, which would go through the whole film that he scored um and right. and i tended to approach big finish things with a theme for each character that would weave itself in and out of every story um okay. i recently did the sound design and music for an audio novel um by matthew waterhouse who played adric right and it had the daleks in it and my favorite telly story for the Daleks is Death to the Daleks with mm -hmm. John Pertwee um, and that has a really bizarre theme for the Daleks which sort of goes eh, 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 eh. even just humming it in that peculiar way <laughs> brings it all back to me and so in this what you got it really good actually oh thank you <laughs> thank you very much but in this watches the dalek theme is that but it's sort of orchestral it's uh, pom, pom, pom. okay lots of and... drums and things and then choirs and all that but it's basically uh, 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 
So I do things like that. I cheat, basically. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and this was the the Watchers, uh, which was written uh, and performed by Matthew Waterhouse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's become yeah. a good friend as well in the last few years. Uh, yeah, uh, he, he's uh, one of the few people who's been down with his husband to um, uh, to to Cornwall to visit me, and it's a joy. Oh, nice. He's always it's a joy uh, to to yeah, see. Yeah, he's very talented. I've I've really enjoyed his recent uh, writing and performances. Uh, yeah. One of them, you know, one of them. I wish I could remember the name of it. One of them was absolutely, without a doubt, one of the best Doctor Who stories I've ever heard in my entire life. And oh. I, saying that, I would think that I'd be able to remember it. I'll, I'll, th I'll think of that. I think I will remember that uh, here. I'm, I'm going to have to give that some thought. It was just absolutely excellent story. Okay, I, I I need to think about that because it was it would be it would be rather lovely if it was watchers, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, it, yes, yeah, that would be convenient. Um, <laughs> but it it was something where I compared him to uh, one of the greatest American writers ever, especially in in our part of the country. I, now I'm really curious. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to remember that. I, in fact, I'll I'll remember it and I'll put it down here in the subtitles. Um, Lovely. Okay. Uh, I've interviewed some musicians in the past that have told me that they have to be in a certain mood to create music. Um, they said that they have to be inspired, and uh, I've I've been told that months can go by uh, where they just don't feel creative or inspired. And then all of a sudden it just pops and, and, and it's just there. Um, can you relate to that? Um, or can you just manually switch on musical inspiration and creativity like a switch? Um, I find um, I, I can relate to it in that some, if I haven't got a commission or if I don't know that something's going to be released or produced as a play or whatever, I find it impossible to do. So I, I couldn't just write a novel or um, a piece of music or, or, or a script or whatever um, if I hadn't been asked to do it. So I think that being asked to do it, John Pertwee would have said it's the check at the end. Well, I think... <laughs> the, the, there's a kind of truth in that in that it, because you're having to do it in a certain time frame I think that releases me releases my creativity so maybe okay. it is maybe it's as simple as the check at the end I don't know okay very good very good Bit so the check if it the, is <laughs> the, ch the check at the end can can throw the switch <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was not horrible but I think it's <laughs> it's it's not as simple as just the money it's the being asked to do it and also yeah that when I used to run a theatre company which I did um after a year in the West End um I had a, a horrible year where I had just two days work or something so I decided to run my own theatre company which lasted about 10 years and what I would do was hire the theatre um for about mm, two two or three months hence then i'd write a, a, think of a title then i'd make the poster up and then i would write the script <laughs> but mm -hmm. that was only because i knew that i had to because on opening night there had to be a play <laughs> so that was quite a good discipline for, a, for 10 years or whatever yeah okay um the uh this reminds me a little bit when you talk about the check. Uh, I was watching an interview at Big Finish uh, with uh, Christopher Eccleston. Um, mm. I, I think this is actually on YouTube. And um, the interview had him answering fans' questions. And um, one of them, uh, someone asked him, what made you decide to come to work for Big Finish? And his answer was the most honest answer that there could have ever been. He said, well, I am an actor and this is a paid job and this is what I do to support myself and my family. And I thought, wow. Yeah. I mean, how better could you answer a question than that? 
that was an open and shut case and it moved on yeah. to the next question so um that that it that made me think of that um okay mm -hmm. so uh let's switch gears here again and uh let's touch on some of your non doctor who work um could you tell us uh, about the tomorrow people and and your involvement in that yes yes that was just a joy um the tomorrow people was a children's cult uh sci-fi series that went went out in england in um the 70s i think 70s and 80s um about a group of children who were the next stage of humanity so they had telepathic powers um they could telekinesis they could move things around they could disappear at will and appear somewhere else um it was a fabulous idea about the progression of humanity to this next stage of humanity they were called homo superior i think um it was made on the cheap um so the some of the uh, effects and everything were laughably bad but the germ of the idea was fabulous and it had the best title sequence ever um way better than doctor who just mm -hmm. just incredible it, it any one of my generation will see that and will all the nightmares will come back and and, mm -hmm. and it's it's incredible um anyway so i was um i heard that big finish were um doing the tomorrow people and i was in i was at a convention in la with jason hay gallery ah and we were in the jacuzzi <laughs> oh, I'm, a seeing another, I'm seeing another pattern here <laughs> yeah. and i said you're not getting out of this jacuzzi until i have something to do with the tomorrow people i don't mm -hmm. care what it is i'll play a door i, I don't care <laughs> I'll, I'll do anything and mm. so he let me out of the jacuzzi or i let him out <laughs> of the jacuzzi when he said i could write for it and then a couple of stories later um we co we co-produced it for a few years and my take on the tomorrow people was to delve into what it meant as a human being to to be the next stage of humanity you know um, and also the family around them how would you as a mother feel if you saw your daughter suddenly disappear in front of your eyes suddenly have these powers um to consider herself superior you know how would you feel mm -hmm. and, and and how does it affect you knowing that you are the next stage of humanity so that was my take on it and uh also I was planning before it got stopped by um rights issues a year before it, my plans came to fruition but I was planning on bringing back almost the entire cast of the original series because uh, we had one nick young um in 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 the series um but it got cancelled unfortunately but uh, along the time i had a joy it was like it's an old cliche but it was like having a family um doing those uh, and mm -hmm. seeing them in in a creative space and whenever we see each other it's just it's just like yeah come on let's do some more <laughs> nope. so I loved that it was a very happy time okay very good now I believe we touched on dark shadows and uh let's to get back to dark shadows for a moment um it's my understanding that dark shadows started out as a 1960s ABC uh soap opera uh, ABC being the American Broadcasting Corporation. Back then, I think there were only two or three uh, television uh, broadcasting corporations in the States. Um, and it, it uh, had a cult following with over 1,200 episodes, a 2012 film with Johnny Depp, which mm -hmm. ironically, there was a scene in a Doctor Who TV story in New York City, in Manhattan, it may have been Angels Take Manhattan, and there was a giant uh, building size poster uh, on uh, the wall of a building uh, hmm. for uh, Dark Shadows, which was the oh. Johnny Depp version. 
um, kind of a little Easter egg in the, in the TV story. And then, of course, there was a 1991 TV series remake. Uh, and you composed music. Uh, it, it, starting in 2005 or six, Big Finish uh, started producing this as an audio adventure series. And mm. um, you composed music for uh, Dark Shadows. And there's even a CD of your works on that titled Dark Shadows Music from the Audio Dramas Volume <laughs> 1, which I listened to in its entirety last night. Oh, did you pull um, y- yes, I did. I went and bought it. When I was working <laughs> on the interview questions for you and I saw that, I went to Big Finish and went, this is three dollars. I th- let me just download this and listen to the oh. whole thing. And and I did detect your uh uh inspiration from Pink Floyd in one of those songs, the one with the clocks and, and the mm-hmm. chimes and all of that. But anyway, to to finish the question. Um, there was also a second release titled Dark Shadows Music from the Audio Dramas Volume 2, where you worked with oh, yes. other compo- composers, uh, David Darlington and Mike McLennan. Um, mm-hmm. So could you briefly tell us about your Dark Shadows music days at Big Finish? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, I was doing the sound design for them, and, and, and part of the sound design was to do the music. So it was, again, necessity, you know. Um, uh, uh, but I have to say that CD of <laughs> my music, I thought they were joking when they said, would I put together a CD of my music? I thought, come on, not this can't be real. Um, but it went ahead and I even had to write sleeve notes, just like John Williams did for Star Wars. So, uh, <laughs> I was... I, I'm so proud that I got to do that. Not necessarily proud of the music, but just just that's a thing. <laughs> My music is on the CD somewhere. I just think that's hilarious. <laughs> and um, yeah, because I'm not a musician, but you know, I can hear themes and things. I think there's also a track, and I can't remember whether it's on the first one or the second one, where I got a friend in to sing. Yes, um, that's on the first one. And in fact, I think it's track four or five. Oh, is it? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the first one. Uh, yeah, I heard that last night, and uh, that was right before the one with the Gregorian chants. Oh, yes, that's probably me. <laughs> oh, really? Used... That was you doing that? Wow. Uh, probably. Okay. Probably. I used to sing on them quite a lot, <laughs> <laughs> and add lots of reverb, so you couldn't tell that I can't really sing. <laughs> well, anyway, the reverb I can harmonize could... all right. <laughs> right. Well, I found several of those stories to be just hauntingly gorgeous. I maybe I was really in the mood for listening to that type of music last night, oh, but it, it's it's great. And I mean, I think that listeners and watchers should just go and get both of those i mean they're only three dollars each and you've got hours of fun music and big finish's site is so fast now you can download it and i think it took 27 seconds to download the album and (laughs) and uh so i had some great fun last night thank you for that and i think other people would enjoy it as well so that's so um, kind of you thank you so much (laughs) my pleasure my pleasure okay um Here's a hugely open-ended question, and it's because of how big Blake Seven is. I, I I couldn't really figure out the best way of asking you about Blake Seven. So, um, what work have you done with Blake Seven? Which I think earlier you said Blake Seven was almost a rival to Doctor Who at some point. Yeah, and uh, it's it's really big. I'd be shocked if there were any Doctor Who uh, fans out there that have not heard of Blake Seven. Right. Um, I, I didn't know whether it had transferred across to the States or not. That, that's that's kind of not as thought. much. Not as right. much. I wouldn't say as large as, as Doctor Who. Yeah. Uh yeah. but given given how much time it's been since uh that was produced and in our modern day of communications with the internet, um, yeah. people should be better informed now if they haven't seen it. I've I've watched a lot of the old episodes and I've listened to the big Finnish dramas. I love them. So um, what was what has been your involvement with Blake Seven? I think I, I, I wrote a fair few of the first ones, which were 
a bit like another thing I worked on with Doctor Who, which was Companion Chronicles, which is m m mainly one character telling a story, but with other actors coming in to play occasional scenes. Um, mm. And I loved writing those because you really got into the um, into the heads of the characters, and you were able to tell stories of their either their childhood or or just being a member of the crew and what it felt like. And that's my kind of storytelling, particularly in the audio medium. Um, I think I think quite a few of the I don't. I hate to say it, but I don't really listen to a lot of the Big Finish stuff. I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, no, no, no. That's not not surprising. Uh, but um, occasionally, when I have heard them, I thought, well, if th these could almost be soundtracks of television things that have been un that haven't been made. Do you know what I mean? As a Doctor yeah. Who fan, I mm -hmm. think you're invested enough in the visual memory of the characters to fill in the gaps that you wouldn't necessarily be able to fill in if you didn't know the series. Right. Whereas, and, and that to me isn't really satisfying as a thing to listen to, but what is satisfying as a thing to listen to, I think, are stories to, told, which can only be told in the audio medium, really, like mm -hmm. these dramatized monologues um where the, the, where one of the characters is addressing the audience um with scenes to illustrate so yes i really got into that format i really loved that and then um uh i, I oh no oh, oh i know i took over the sound designer music for a while um i did a lot of those for for blake 7 yeah but m my most thrilling moment was hearing Paul Darrow, who played Avon. Um, on the original TV series. On the original TV yes, series. Yeah. Yes, and he's uh, unfortunately passed away. He has, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I only met him a couple of times, but um, he, he did one called Brother, which was about Avon's brother and how Avon got to be Avon. And I think he delivered that so well. I know he was quite ill, was it was towards the end, but his delivery on that, I I I just loved. I thought it was brilliant, uh, so I really treasure that as as yeah as one of my favorite bits of Blake Seven that I would contributed to. And that yeah. was titled Brother, and you Brother. Did the yeah. yeah, and you did the music and sound design. No, 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 somebody else did it. Um, okay. I just wrote that one. You yeah. wrote it. You wrote it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. good. That's I'm going to have to go listen to that one. Um, I also do not have a lot of time to listen to, to audios, uh, and it's not just Big Finish. It, it's pretty much anything. Um, I used to have a lot more time, but uh, it's it's been it's been years ago. Um, and I'm hoping in the future I have a whole bunch of things stored up to listen to and read, and I'm hoping at some point in the future I'm going to have an abundance of time on my hands. I um, think possibly when your twins are in their 20s, maybe you yeah. might get time. I don't know. I think I might be busier then than, <laughs> than now. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, all right. So I think that was the last largely open-ended question. And I, I didn't want to give you a bunch of open-ended questions, but with Blake 7, it, it's so large um, that I, I was not able to locate your involvement in that. And I've uh, just thought of a funny Blake Seven story. You can cut okay. this if you like, Let, because it's not particularly please, relevant. Please do tell. <laughs> um, uh, um, Jan Chapel, who played Callie, who was the telepath in Blake Seven, and that, when I was watching it younger, she was always my favourite character. So I got to write for her, which was a thrill. But anyway, I first met Jan at a dinner party at Louise's house and we were sat mm -hmm. next to each other and it was a thrill and she was quite eccentric and, and just very, very funny. Then um, her mobile rang uh, in her handbag, uh, which was odd because she had her mobile on the, phone, on, the, on the table in front of her. And I thought, well, that's odd. She's got two mobiles. Um, anyway, <laughs> so... And, and she picked it up and she said, hello, in a really odd <laughs> French accent. 
Uh, yes, this is the error. I will just, um, I will have to speak to you later. Um, probably in a better accent than I can do. But um, and I said, what was that? And she said, oh, that's my agent. And I said, you speak to your agent in a French accent. She said, no, I was being my agent. And she she was her own agent, but with a different a different accent and a different name, with a different phone. And she said, sometimes I have an awful time because I pick up the wrong the the, the agent's phone and I answer as myself. So I have to pretend to the casting director that I'm working in the office for my agent uh, between <laughs> jobs and everything. She ended up representing me for a year. I I was on her books for a year as uh, she was my agent. <laughs> Trouble is she was getting work, so you know she couldn't really represent me very well. But she's bonkers. Uh, I adore her. Mm. She used to live in a. Oh no, that's too much. But um, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. okay, Bay uh, Babe and the Butcher, Colin Baker. Oh, lovely Colin. Yes, Babe and the Butcher. Uh, yeah. Yes, I uh, I don't know whether it's out yet, but I wrote an audio. No, uh, novel which was the origins of Babe and the Butcher who was one uh, uh, Colin played this baddie in in one story one Blake Seven story and um I had to write the novel of how he became Babe and the Butcher okay um, well don't tell too much because I'm not sure that that's out yet either uh, I'll, I'll right, okay. go look yeah I don't uh I don't have a laptop sitting right here but mm -hmm. now as soon as you said I don't know if that's out i think you're right I, I think it's not yet all right so okay well, that's a joy to come then i'm i haven't heard it but i'm sure that colin did a brilliant job on it he's a fantastic actor okay he's really great now i did find something else of yours that is not out yet and then and we're going to get to that here in in just a couple of minutes um the uh Focusing on the Avengers, um, oh, oh, okay, here it is. It's actually this right here. Um, am I correct that you have written a story for Big Finish, yeah. the Avengers, the comic strip adaptions? And yes. actually, I see that that comes out in 2023, and I think it's either March or April. I loved working on that. That's been one of my favorite things for Big Finish for years. I just adored it it was like i think i'd just written the baber novel which was quite heavy going and everything and i'd written the the one that's coming out this week um who am i and who am um, i which yeah was, that comes out i think next week yeah so it had all been quite dense and and you know depressing <laughs> and then uh i uh, lovely sam clements whose dad uh, Brian Clemens um, created the Avengers, asked me to write for uh, 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 an Avengers story um, and sent me two pages of a comic strip saying, this is all we've got. Um, but I happened to know, having stayed at Matthew Waterhouse's house on a number of occasions, that... You can say in... that. <laughs> <laughs> How many people uh, can say that? <laughs> <laughs> but in his guest room, there's a pile piles of tv comics lasting all the way from 1960 whatever through to 1970 whatever when the doctor the doctor who comic strip was in tv comics so he's got that whole range so i knew he'd have the whole avengers story in in his guest bedroom so he very kindly um <laughs> scanned the whole thing in for me um and it's it's campers knickers the 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 tv comic uh um adaptation or, or no stories of the avengers um uh, a very light and a wonderful story about ice cream being hypnotic or something I, I can't quite remember the story it was so out there and bonkers so i had to take the essence of that and turn it into an audio drama and i had such fun doing it i'd already been a guest actor on one of the Avengers um I think one or maybe two of the Avengers CDs already so I knew the tone I knew it was light frothy uh fun and um a good a good basic story you know uh, an adventure 
Um, so I knew the tone I had to have, and I just loved it. I can't wait to hear that. I wish it was that one coming out in three days because I really am looking forward. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's March, so it's that that'll be here right. pretty quick. Uh, yeah, it's, the uh, Big Finish has a, the release dates posted for that already, and they don't often change. They usually come out right uh, when that says so. And you, mm. you haven't heard it yet. No. Oh no no. No. Okay. No. I, I, as as a writer, you don't really get to hear it until uh, it's been released, and you get a CD through the post. Okay. So, uh, okay. Very good. Yeah. I uh, somehow I had this strange idea in my head that uh, that as as uh, an artist that uh, you would be able to listen to it just as soon as it was uh, finished. Um, no. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard that before about waiting for a CD in the mail. Okay, um, so with that's that's not the way you describe that. All right, I'm gonna go pre-order that tonight too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that that sounds great. Okay, um, Vienna. Uh, taking a look at the big Finnish audio series Vienna, uh, which s starred uh, Chase Masterson, yes. who was also in Star Trek: Deep Space Nine. Uh, you also did music and sound design, uh, here for series two. Um, yeah. and I listened to a little bit of that and I'm wondering, do you recall that being a different musical style for you to work on? I'm afraid I, I don't remember it. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I know I definitely did it. I remember yes. doing it, but, um, I had an accident with my computer. Um, it fell off my table a few years back and unfortunately I lost my whole back catalogue of Big Finish so oh, all wow. I have uh, up till that time which includes Vienna are the CDs so uh I haven't listened to that okay okay I was, I was just so I, I'm, I'm really can't remember it I'm so sorry no 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 that's okay that's okay I uh you're, I think you're it, I'm, I'm actually surprised oh, I'm sorry what were you gonna say what about two girls f fighting um, baddies. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, I I don't. <laughs> I, I have not. I haven't actually heard it. And w when uh, I, 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 I I I'm trying. I, I tried to make as comprehensive of a list of your works as I possibly could. I've seen the cover art. I, and I know who oh, Chase Masterson. Yeah, is I know good? who Chase Masterson is. Yes, <laughs> the cover art's great. In fact, um, but you know, I, I'm glad I caught you on something here where you didn't quite recall it because that would make perfect sense because of your massive, successful list of works. Oh, bless you. It, it would. It would. It would make absolute sense that there's one that you don't quite recall right now. Okay, <laughs> and and um, did you also work on the Big Finish original series, At a Girl? Yes, I did. Yeah, uh, as an okay. actor. Yes, I was a. I think I was a doctor in in that who had to perform an abortion. It was a really dark scene or series of scenes. I remember and uh, yeah, beautifully written. And um, I've not heard it, but certainly in the studio, it was amazing. There was an amazing cast. So yeah, that was a, okay. a really good day. Okay. Mm. I've heard one of those too, and I, I recall it being quite enjoyable. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, this here, I think you're going to enjoy. Uh, Shilling and Sixpence. Uh, you are shown as a writer and a producer of mm -hmm. Big Finish, Shilling and Sixpence, Investigate, uh, with the story Cease to Be coming out this November. Now, I was going to say, isn't this yet even another hat as a producer, but earlier you did mention having produced before. Yeah, I produced Sapphire and Steel and The Tomorrow People as, right. as well. So uh, yes, I, I have got form. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, yeah, Shilling and Sixpence Investigate, I'm really, really proud of. Um, uh, it's the one I mentioned, which had David Warner and Celia Emery in the leads, but also it's based on, um, a dinner theater uh, serial, um, a murder mystery 
dinner theatre serial that I wrote over 25 years. So every month I'd write a new episode, all set in the same fictional village or and series of villages, as it turned out. Over all with 25 years? 25 years, yes. What? Uh, um, all, all, there are hundreds and hundreds of episodes, um, all, all telling the one story. Um, wow. But... You know, as 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 punters, you could come along to uh, whichever venue you chose and just try and figure out a murder mystery, or you could come every month and get a new episode. And we did it in steam trains, in um, jailhouses, in theatres, in restaurants, or cinemas, all over, um, with the most talented group of actors, all of whom, well, five of whom, are in Shilling and Sixpence Investigate, together with um, uh, Celia, David, uh, Matthew, um, Lisa Bowman, and uh, in the first series, Louise Jameson. But uh, Louise also makes... Um, I bullied her into playing uh, a small part in the second series yet to come you better as well. be careful bullying her she's got a big knife <laughs> See, that's, that's, and that's Leela. okay that's Leela. and jane is the ones as well yeah um <laughs> uh yeah so she was kind enough to to do that um for me but um i'm so proud of it, uh, it it's and especially proud now that david's gone that it was one of his very last jobs and we didn't think we were going to get him in the studio because he was so ill. But those two mm. days, he was alive again. And, um, mm. yeah. Sorry, get a bit tearful. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, okay. All right. Mm. Well, um, I just realized we've gone about 20 minutes over what our planned time was. So uh, oh. <laughs> we. I'm pleased to let you know that we only have 30 more minutes of questions. No, <laughs> there's actually, there's just two or three more here. So we're, we're about to wrap it up. Um, when did you start watching Doctor Who and who is your doctor? Oh, well, in the 60s, everyone watched it uh, in, in the UK. It was just because we only had three channels. Uh, everyone watched Doctor Who on a Saturday night. There was no question about it. And you'd always mm -hmm. talk in in the playground on Monday morning about Doctor Who. Just everyone did. It was just a thing. Um, so, yeah, I grew up with it. I, I first became a, a, a fan, I think, when um, I realised that there was more than one. Um, so it must have been about the three Doctors or something. And I saw these other two and I thought, well, who are these and, and what's going on here? And then I kind of vaguely had memories of another one and, and things. And so I inter investigated that a bit. But in answer to the second part of your question, John Pertwee was definitely my doctor. Okay. And of the new lot, Matt Smith. I had a okay. lovely, lovely chat with Katie Manning at a party or a wedding or something um, about uh, there's a lovely scene that Russell T Davis wrote brilliantly in the Sarah Jane Adventures where it's Matt Smith and Katie Manning and you just get that recognition that Matt Smith and John Pertwee are the same person and she played it beautifully he played it beautifully so yeah I'd say Matt Smith and John Pertwee are my two okay so you, you have two doctors all right <laughs> um <laughs> I, I noticed that you and I are about the same age, and um, you didn't happen to catch any of the uh, the the stories that have been lost and wiped uh, on television well, back. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I probably. I, I guess they didn't them. repeat them. No, no. Okay. I, I mean, I do, I do vaguely remember Pat Troughton's work, you know, the Doctor, but um, I, I have no sort of. Um, solid memories of them i'm afraid okay okay for some reason i had always thought that uh some of those episodes would have been repeated no. and that people in our age range might have been able to catch them so okay no very, no very no, no they, they didn't do that then <laughs> okay okay very interesting um okay so this is the uh this is the last question on writing here um one thing that i've noticed uh is common with writers is that I guess you're not always 100% successful 
because that would be kind of a fairy tale. And there's this thing called rejection yeah. um, where you write something, you may believe in your heart that this is the best Doctor Who story that's ever existed. And it's amazing that no one's ever thought of this before, you know, stuff like that. And then you send it off or submit it and you either don't hear back or you get a uh, form rejection letter or something like that. Um, have you dealt or ha have you experienced rejection oh. and, ha and how did you deal with that? Yeah, well, more as an actor, um, because okay. uh, working as an actor, rejection is just there the whole time. Um, really? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Your audition um and not get the part or you'll do a, a, a casting and never hear back and so yes it's constant mm. constant rejection okay. you have to have a really thick skin to to be an actor particularly in okay over in the uk um so yeah i'm i'm used to it um there was a time when i gave up the creative industry because it was it was too much the rejection was too much and really um uh, I became a psychodynamic counselor for four years, um, which was interesting, a therapist. Um, then I went back and took those skills that I'd learned as a therapist into my creative work, wow. um, to, which wow. benefited me really. Um, but I also, uh, I've also now given up um, reading, uh, what do you call it, reviews, um, because either way, it's not going to work for you. Um, if you if you have a good review, then you start to believe your own press. And certainly as an actor, it changes your performance. If you have a bad review, you're devastated. You can't get out of bed. Um, wow. And 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 review reviewers certainly in the Doctor Who world, I learned quite early on, can be so cruel, so very cruel that um, I just had to after a few particularly vile ones, I just had to put it to bed and think, right, no, I need to not not even engage or certainly not even read those. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Louise is the same. We've talked about this many times that uh, certainly when we're working on something, we would never read a review, never. Okay. Uh, maybe later, you know, when you finish the role <laughs> or whatever, you look back and... You think, oh, yeah, you have to think, I just do the best work I can. And I think it's the same. Every villain believes they're right. It's the same with every creative person on the planet. You never go out to make a bad piece of art or piece of work. Nobody okay. ever does that. Right. You, what, 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 whatever you may think as a listener or a watcher or an audience member, you are not seeing people who are deliberately creating bad work. This just doesn't happen. Everyone wants to make a good piece of work. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. So that's what you have to focus on as okay. a creative. Person. Gotcha. Gotcha. That kind of kind of ties in with our our uh, final question here. Uh, the uh, to listeners and viewers of this uh in the future there may be uh, younger people and potentially aspiring actors uh writers uh musicians uh that 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 uh seek this interview out in order to to learn from it and um they may have dreams and goals of becoming successful in areas such as yourself uh which i believe is undeniable um, and what what would you tell these people? Uh, is there a place for them in the creative industry? Is there is there something they really need to do uh, in order to achieve success such as yourself? I think they'll absolutely know um, that. I think if you're a true creative person, if you're meant to be doing it as a job, you will know. You, you, you will have no doubt that that's the only thing you're here to do, um, which sounds pretty grand, but it transcends needing to pay the bills 
uh, I've lived in a caravan or, uh, with no water or uh, electricity or whatever, just because I needed to create at that particular time, uh, for example, um, you will absolutely know that you are here on this planet to do the job. If there's any doubt at all about that, don't do it go and join an amateur dramatic society or or take up a hobby writing or, or whatever um you will absolutely know because it'll be the only thing that brings you joy so i think follow your joy okay very interesting um we have a new doctor coming to our tv oh station. yes yeah it's uh it looks like the jody whitaker era is coming uh to a close very soon actually I loved it um and we have shuti gatwa and yes. the return of russell t davies are you excited yes. about that <laughs> of course who is it yeah I just, I just, surely nobody can not be excited by that <laughs> shuti I've not met him. I'm dying to meet him. I want to work with him. He's brilliant. He's such a good actor. Have you seen mm -hmm. um, Sex Education? Sex He's Education. Yes, absolutely. Dude. Yeah, I've I've seen several episodes. I haven't quite binge watched it yet, but I probably will before the new Doctor Who story comes on. He is absolutely excellent, and this is going to be great. And Russell T. Davis is a genius. I'm sorry. He is an right. absolute genius. He writes truth. His characters um, are always grounded in truth and his dialogue, everything about his work is, is absolutely grounded and brilliant. And I'm just very excited about it. Okay, yeah. very good. Um, to uh, listeners and viewers, uh, the closing title cards here on YouTube are going to have some links where you can uh, order the big Finnish works of Nigel Fares. Um, you, you actually don't even need those. Just go to bigfinish.com and type in Nigel Fares. It, it's that simple. And that will pull up a list of his works, uh, which are so diverse that it may surprise you. Uh, it really surprised me. And I think that Nigel is probably on a uh, very short list of uh people uh creators in the uh worlds of doctor who and beyond that ha have been involved in the creative processes from so many different angles um uh, as 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 a writer actor musician actor writer musician um and go ahead and go out thank him for his time today that he has given back to fandom uh in in, in this 90 minutes that we've spent together he could have been writing, but instead he decided to go ahead and give some of his time to fandom. And I think he should be rewarded for that. And at the same time, we can reward ourselves and we can go order some new uh, stories uh, that we're going to love. So uh, that would, we'll have a couple links in the closing credits. Uh, Nigel, was there anything that I did not ask that you would like to answer? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the only thing you didn't ask was what next, but I'd already told you what next. So, <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep. It's okay. the tour and Chilligan Sixpence. <laughs> there uh, there okay. we are. <laughs> and we'll put some links to those as well. Um, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, you are very kind, and I consider it to be a uh, lifetime honor to have had the opportunity to speak with you and to interview you. I, I'm shocked. That's really oh. all I can say. <laughs> oh, bless you. It's been an absolute joy to talk with you. It really has. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I and uh, I, can I just say that uh, I think your twins are, uh, are very lucky. Oh. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel, you are so kind. Okay. <laughs>